Hey, ¿qué pasa, Galexico? Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, today we're here at the Imperial Valley Food Bank. I'm here with Executive Director Sarah Griffin. Uh, thank you for being here today. Thank, thank you, you for, for having me. Uh, I know you're, you're super busy, so um, I, I don't want to take too much of your time, but um, I kind of wanted to um, come by and visit you guys because... Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Let's just take care of that. <laughs> We don't have a fancy phone system here. <laughs> Everybody gets to pick up the telephone. <laughs> yeah. And see, that's what I'm saying. Like, you're busy, busy, busy. So thank you for taking that time today. Um, but yeah, I wanted to come here because I know you guys, um, you know, I hear a lot about the Imperial Valley Food Bank. Um, but in reality, like, I don't really know how it works. So, like, mm -hmm. I kind of, this is one of the main things I try to do with my podcast is um, kind of, like, learn, learn something mm -hmm. myself and at the same time inform the community of, yeah. you know, the, the services um you know, that are out there and, you know, the things that you guys do. So, um, but before we begin, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? You know, I know you've been here a while now. Okay. Um, well, um, I want to thank you for, for doing this because it's very hard to learn about things in the Valley because our, our media is quite small mm. and not extensive. And so it, it's good to delve into a topic uh, a little deeper than like a, you know, a cursory headline or, or that yeah. sort of thing. So I, I appreciate that you're doing this. Um, I, I'm from Pennsylvania originally. I grew up on the East Coast. I went to college in Philadelphia and lived in New York City where I was a dress designer uh, mm -hmm. many moons ago. And um, through um, a job opportunity from um, my first marriage, uh, we moved to San Juan Capistrano and stayed in Orange County for many years. Uh, during that time, I became a single mother, raised two children alone in a very expensive county, mm -hmm. and understood, I think, personally how difficult it was to provide uh, for my kids as a single mom. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a, a pretty decent job, but again, in a very expensive place to live, yeah. that somewhat good salary didn't go very far. And... Um, I was lucky enough to work in um, the art world, the performing arts, and support um, arts through fundraising and event design. And so that's kind of how I got my fundraising background, by doing that work. And then um, I married a, a very lovely man uh, in 2007, and we were uh, assigned to the Imperial Valley in 2009. My husband's a Methodist minister in El Centro. And um, so the bishop sent us here, and I had no idea what I would do. And so the first year here, I worked for the El Centro Chamber of Commerce and did their events and uh, did some fundraising for them. And then when this job came available, I thought it was a good fit for my fundraising background, but also my understanding of how difficult it is um, to try to stretch food dollars when you just don't have enough. Yeah, yeah. Well, kind of like... Um like you say, like you didn't know what you were gonna do, but it kind of like it, it. It was a calling. Yeah, I knew it when it it appeared. <laughs> yeah, it's it's um funny how you know sometimes like do things that uh, things do happen in in that way that you know. Yeah, th there are no coincidences. Yeah, <laughs> um, I just want to mention that you know I came here a couple of weeks ago just kind of like see the facility and you know, sure. and I just want to say that you know you have a really good staff. You know, everybody seems. Like really happy like working here and and they're really helpful jesse downstairs was like he greeted me and he's like really helpful and like kind of like yeah. told me what he does and and um you know i, I guess like when you're helping people you kind of like makes your job feel like you know not a job you're like you're just happy to do what yeah. you're doing and yeah. like um stephanie and then the lady that that's in charge of the Alba. back mm -hmm. uh, backpack oh ariana yes yeah yes. she was like yeah like they're really really helpful just wanted i just wanted to mention that because yeah, something that I noticed when I came by. Um, speaking of Jesse, he's he's um, he already helps people um, with the mm -hmm. uh, cow fresh or right. We we're mentioning that you know it changes name. It's been changing names lately. Like, yeah, so, um, it's it's the food stamp program, mm -hmm. and still everybody I think knows what it is when you say it's the food stamp program. But it it nationally has the name of SNAP, which is Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. But in California, they and, and California tends to do this. We label everything California. So here it's called Cal Fresh. But it's the same program. Um, you know, in Oklahoma, you apply for SNAP. In California, you apply for Cal Fresh. Okay. 
and, but he is a great advocate of that program and, and um, his staff is growing. And if I may take this opportunity, I just want to mention there um, are some substantial changes in the CalFresh law in California that take effect June 1st. And that is any senior or disabled person who currently gets SSI as part of their social security is not currently eligible for CalFresh. And that changes as of June 1st. And all those people who are currently receiving SSI will now be cashed out of that program and move into CalFresh. And so it's going to take a uh, considerable effort by our Department of Social Services, our Area Agency on Aging, ourselves, and I believe Catholic Charities is going to come on and, and try to help with this work because we need to get to thousands of people over the next six months and transition them into CalFresh. Yeah, we, we have a big population of, you know, uh, senior citizens. Oh, yes. Yeah. Calexico has a big population. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't know uh, yeah. other cities, but I mean, I live in Calexico and I, I you yes. know, there's a lot of um, senior citizen apartments. So absolutely. So, yeah, it's going to be a, a lot of work for Jesse and his team. And mm-hmm. um, but yeah, um, he was mentioning that, you know, a lot of people don't, you know, they struggle to, you know, put food on, on the absolutely. table. And but yet they, they don't know that, you know, they might, uh, uh, you know, be approved for maybe right. not a lot of help, but a little bit of a help. So. It's 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 good to stop by and, and maybe you know if, if you're Absolutely. out there and you're like kind of struggling like if you're curious uh, call us here at the food bank uh, ask to speak to the CalFresh department they can ask you some simple questions that would let you know whether it's worth your time to apply and if it is definitely do it mm-hmm. yeah yeah because that's a big help um it's called the food bank and it's mainly because a lot of you know. You're the main source of, you know, where everybody comes in and drops off, the, you know, food that gets distributed to different kinds of programs, right? Is that main? Is that- yeah, I, I think it came more from the withdrawal system. This um, Food banking started in Phoenix, Arizona about 50 years ago by an, a man named John Van Hinkle. And the very first food bank of St. Mary's, which still exists in Phoenix, and it is like a depository for donated food that comes from all different sources. And then small agencies can come and withdraw the food that they need to serve their community. And so here in the Valley, um, we are the main, the only uh, regional distribution center for that product. And we're a big distribution warehouse. We, you know, we look like the Walmart center or the Costco center. We, everything is industrial. Everything's on pallets. It's a big deal. And we are that deal. And we take that burden from an agency like your church or Catholic Charities or Salvation Army that doesn't have the infrastructure to deal with that kind of volume. Mm -hmm. Also, there's an awful lot of food safety issues that are now, um, you know, have increased, I'd say, over the last two decades that we also take the burden uh, off of agencies to take care of and refrigeration and freezer capacity, which, as you know, your local church does not have the ability to do that. Yeah. So um, it allows, um, it's a convenient economical way to house all of the donated product for the county in one central location. And then those smaller agencies can come and withdraw the food that they need to serve their local community. Okay. Yeah. Um, And like in terms of like funding for, you know, salaries, because that's, you know. Right. How do you, how do you guys get funded? And so... Part of the food that we receive is from the the U.S. government through the USDA TFAP program, which is sort of uh, known as the commodity program. Mm-hmm. So um, we distribute that food for the entire valley. And for that, we get a reimbursement from the government for running that product. Unfortunately, it's only 50 cents on the dollar. So we do have to fundraise for that additional 50%. Uh, we also run programs that have no reimbursement, including the backpack program, which I know we'll talk about a, l- a little more later. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're completely looking for um, community support to help fund that local program. Mm-hmm. So our budget is annually about a million dollars to keep the food bank running. Uh, so all pro- programs combined, we get approximately $125,000 a year from the U.S. government. So we are looking to fundraise for that additional amount. It's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So we do, we're very active in writing grants to foundations to help us do our work. Um, Also, we do a few events locally. 
And we're very dependent on local people who really care about other local people, especially our children and seniors who um, donate monthly. And that is, uh, to us, we call those sustainable members because they help us sustain our operation, people who give a monthly check to the food bank. It, it, that is gold for us because we need to know where our money's coming from. And mm-hmm. as any you know, good business is run, you want to know uh, where your profits are coming from. We don't have profits. We just have, a, a, you know, sus, uh, money that keeps us going. But um, it's a lot of effort from a very small amount of people to to make this happen. And like say, if, if anybody wants to like donate, um, mm-hmm. whether it's food or it's um, money, mm-hmm. um, how would they go about that? Or um, We have a, a website. Uh, it is um, ivfoodbank.org. And uh, there is a PayPal um, donate button on there, that, and that's how um, folks can do that online. Uh, a lot of our donors are still check writers, and so we get monthly checks. A lot of um, a lot of those monthly donors pay us through their um, checking account, mm. just like they would pay a bill. So we get a monthly check uh, from their bank in whatever amount that they're giving, and so then they, they're not having to sit there and write that check every mm. month. Yeah. Um, that's principally how people are donating to us. And again, um, food is a great donation, especially if you have, um, if you're modeling that behavior for children, you know, we are generous. We, we learn to give to other people in this way, but honestly, we, um, we do prefer money because all of our food comes in big pallets. And so the individual can is hard for us to, to manage. It's much easier for us to, to uh, deal with um, taking your money and buying wholesale or less than wholesale uh, because it gets us more food in the end. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see. Um, I know you guys are, are getting a new uh, facility. Um, yes. Can you tell us where it's going to be at and, you know, and mm-hmm. like the um, new and improved features that you guys are going to have over there? Well, it's been a long time coming. Um, we've been in the, our current buildings for um, over 20 years, and uh, they weren't built for modern food safety. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't have enough refrigeration, and we don't have any freezer space. We've had to add on to converted truck units on the outside of our buildings to handle the little bit of frozen we can handle right now. But more and more of our food is coming cold and frozen, mm-hmm. and we just can't keep up in, in this space. We also have no loading dock. Everything is on gr- on grade here, and mm. we do four million pounds plus a year right. without a lot loading dock. It's just very difficult for us to um, to do things efficiently. Mm-hmm. So, uh, because of these increased food safety standards, we knew we had to build a new facility um, probably back in 2015. It took us quite a few years to raise the money. It's you know not something that we do here a lot in the valley. We had to raise. Um, quite a few millions of dollars in order to do that. So the new facility is uh, about to be complete. It's on uh, the corner of La Brucherie and Aiton Road, and it's the the northeast corner in the Imperial Business Park. Mm -hmm. And um, it greatly increases our warehouse capability. Um, we're going to uh, probably not quite double our shelf-stable capacity, but almost. Our uh, cold storage will be two and a half times what we have now, and our frozen storage uh, also about two and a half times more than what we have currently. Um, we'll have a loading dock. <laughs> what a concept. <laughs> We're an yeah. industrial warehouse with no loading dock. <laughs> so um, that will make things a lot easier for uh, our staff, for sure. And even things like um, these warehouses aren't air conditioned. There's there's no air mm-hmm. it, it, literally here. We have to open the roll up doors as far as possible and hope for a breeze. <laughs> so um, in the new warehouse, it's not air conditioned, but the um, insulation on the ceiling and the walls is very high grade. And we've put in those enormous fans in the warehouse and with the interior refrigeration and freezer uh, space inside the warehouse, we're going to be able to keep that room much cooler for mm-hmm. staff and for volunteers moving forward. And we're very grateful for that because we all know what we deal with here in the summer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you mentioned volunteers. Um, what, what type of volunteers like do you guys um, like need or, or accept um, to come mm-hmm. by? 
and how can they, you know, sign up? I think we have a couple of layers of, of types of volunteers. We have those who help us by being on our board or our fundraising committees um, for events like our Harvest Bowl, which is our our big uh, fundraising dinner we have every year. And then we have volunteers who might come and help us in the office with um, filing or answering phones. We are looking for uh, some receptionists in the new building, and that will be a new layer of volunteerism that we haven't had before. Um, we don't have the, you know, funding to hire a receptionist. So we are looking to create a program where we can, um, have some volunteers help us with that. And then we have volunteers who come and help us in the warehouse to do bagging or, um, sorting of food. And every Wednesday morning we have a, a dedicated group that comes to bag backpacks. So, um, different levels of ways you can help in the food bank. And there certainly in the new one, there'll be more opportunities for that. Okay. Yeah. I have a, a friend, a uh, former coworker. He's already retired t- a teacher from Calexico, the, um, John Glazier. If you know. Oh, he's, he's our number one volunteer. Yeah. He's, <laughs> he's always uh, running around and I see him dropping off, you know, the yeah, boxes at the school. Delivers the backpacks to schools. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, there's, uh, all kinds of programs, um, you know, whether it's uh, food that you come pick up that you qualify that's for free, but you also sell, um, mm-hmm. I think it's called like a basic box or? Box of basics. Box of basics. Bob. Bob. <laughs> <laughs> so um, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, um, the different types of programs, like people mm-hmm. that, you know, automatically qualify for, you know, free food that can come by and right. pick it up or people that, you know, might need that little box, the Bob and, and can come by and, and, and okay. buy one. So um, the USDA program, the guidelines for that are what we use for really all of our food assistance. And that includes the fresh produce that we're getting locally from the fields that's combined with the USDA program and whatever other food that um, is offered to us. So our, our monthly distributions are for people who uh, are below the federal income line. And at each distribution, there's a guideline of how um, – many people are in your family and then what the maximum amount of money for that month or year because we know like in an instance like the federal shutdown you may make a very good salary during the year but this month you've got zero and Mm -hmm. so that that's important and you qualify because that month you have zero yeah and so we know there are instances where people are laid off or there's a catastrophic event where they just can't keep it together and they literally don't have enough income that month. And so people do qualify that month, even if it's one. And then that might change the next month and we hope it does. But um, that's the qualification for the monthly uh, distributions, which we do through all the agencies that we work with in, in the Valley, as well as our mobile food pantry, which is the way we get food to areas like Salton Sea or Nyland, where they don't have agencies large enough like we have here in El Centro with, let's say, Catholic Charities or Salvation Army, which are our most recognizable agencies in El Centro. Uh, Calexico, you know, you are aware of your agencies there. Mm. Um, But areas like Westmoreland and um, Salton Sea don't have those established agencies with staff and and, um, hours that they operate. And so we run those distributions through a, a refrigerated vehicle. And so the same qualification level, um, the federal income uh, line is the sort of threshold for all of those distributions. The um, box of basics is for anybody. There's no qualification for it because all we're doing is buying food at um, the best price possible and passing that on to our clients. And the box of basics um, is $25 a month and we take CalFresh dollars for the purchase of that box. So it needs to be ordered by the second Tuesday of the month, and it's delivered the third Tuesday. We only buy what we've sold. Uh, But it's a way for people to help manage their dollars, which we know are short. uh, And we know a lot of people run out of their uh, CalFresh money the first week or two of the month. Some Mm. some are good enough to make it last to the third, but almost no one has uh, enough money left for that fourth week. And that's really when hunger's happening in the Valley. And that's, you know, when you're seeing the spikes in um, um, diabetes, uh, you you know, you're seeing more uh, emergency room visits that last week of the month because of the 
you know, the feast or famine, unfortunately, what happens with um, low income and, and food insecure families. Mm-hmm. You, you have it when you have it. And when you don't, things are really bad. Yeah. So we're trying to get that food to that family that last week of the month when they don't have enough resources of their own. It contains um, three meat sources, a gallon of milk, potatoes, eggs, as well as side um, uh, vegetables, side dishes, uh, things in cans, as well as fresh produce. And it's a really nice box of food. And I've heard from folks that not only is it good for um, families, but like for seniors who are too proud for assistance, but still struggle. We've, you know, had churches come and buy 10 boxes to distribute, you know, to um, fragile families within their congregation or whatever. It's a really good means to get food to people who may have a transportation problem or, again, are too proud to um, ask for assistance. Yeah, for help. Um, Let me see. Um, healthy. I, I see that you guys promote a lot of like healthy living. Um, tells the importance of you know make, making sure that, especially the community that you know um, is in in, in need. Um, you know how important it is for them to to eat healthy and and, and uh, promote healthy living too, especially to the to their kids. Because um, I was looking at an article yesterday that there's like 25 percent kids in the United States that don't drink water. And all they drink is, is so. <laughs> And so I was like, what? Are you serious? Like, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, m- more um, Americans are, are um, drinking. Well, as Americans drink more soda, what's in that soda is just um, um, almost cups of sugar. And um, a, a lot of our calories are coming from drinking now instead of just eating. Yeah. And that it's just, you know, adding to the problem. Um, this generation is the first that's going to live less long than their parents. We, you know, over the, I'd say the second half of the 20th century, we saw that life expectancy increase. And now we're seeing it come back. And a, a lot of it has to do with our eating habits, mm-hmm. because it, particularly in Imperial Valley, we have the issues of obesity, overweight and obese. We lump them together, the two O's, uh, because if, if you're overweight and nothing changes, you're moving on to obesity. Mm-hmm. So they're they're kind of interlinked. And the other is diabetes. And both of these are food related. Yeah. At least type two diabetes. So um, what people are putting in their mouths is affecting their health in in very um, strong ways, particularly in Imperial Valley. And we don't see a lot um, on a large scale here about talking about that. There are, there are some folks who just have it. They have that body type where, you know, they have great metabolism or they're at the gym all the time. And then if you don't have it, you don't. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm one of them. (laughs) Yeah, me too. Me too. So I need to be really careful about uh, what I'm uh, putting in my body. But um, we want our children to um, to lead healthy, healthy lives. And we want to change that, that life expectancy back to the positive again and not to the negative. Uh, we want our children to grow up to be just the, the most, um, to fulfill their, their richest potential. Mm-hmm. And if we're not feeding them properly at a young age, they're, they're not going to get there. And we know so much is dependent on um, the type of food you're given, not just that you have enough, but that it's the right quality. Yeah. Uh, there are um, um, cognitive development in, in the brain depends on 1,200 calories a day for young children. And that changes as... They go through growth spurts. They need even more calories in order to, um, for their brains to develop properly. And so if we're not giving that to those children, are we limiting their potential as adults? Because they're not being able to grow proper brain cells as, as children. Mm. And so when you're, you know, when you're putting soda in that, 
baby bottle or or doing you know hot cheetos for you know a two-year-old this this isn't just a short-term problem it's a lifelong yeah. problem and we really want to change that behavior so that we're um, creating the freshest food possible the healthiest food possible for people all through their life not just when they're old enough to uh, make those decisions for themselves yeah um, you talk about, um, you know, um, children and, and, you know, there's a lot of population in the Valley that, um, you know, most of the meals comes from, you know, Monday through Friday when they're at school. Yeah. Um, so during the weekend, um, I know you guys started the backpack problem pro- program. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that works? And Yeah. And we started this back in, uh, I think it's 2006 five or seven sorry i wasn't uh i I don't remember the exact year but we started it up at uh, some of the most vulnerable schools in nyland and uh calipat on the north far north end and um we were at a board meeting one of our board members who was on uh, a member of the southwest uh, high school booster club told us about a story he'd heard of of a uh, kid dumpster diving at Southwest for food. Wow. And then our board started asking other folks who were in the school system about hunger going on in schools. And we learned all these new stories. Um, and we realized that the backpack program needs to exist in every school, not just the ones who are the most vulnerable because, y- you know, again, we got populations of kids who need calories every day, mm. not just when the five days they're at school. And so um, even without funding, our board made the decision to expand that program. And we've been, um, you know, trying to educate the public how important it is and and getting more people to adopt a child in that program. Because we're giving over 700 backpacks weekly to 40 schools in the Valley. And that includes elementary, middle and high school. So... um, the cost of that, I will just put a commercial in here, is $180 a year, or it's $15 a month to sponsor a child in that program. And we'll be doing um, an awareness, awareness campaign about this in August so that we can uh, prepare for the next school year as well. So hopefully folks will look for that and help support kids in maybe their alma mater school or, yeah. um, or their neighborhood school or where their kids are going. Because in the Valley, um, the statistics are pretty profound. One in three children is not getting enough food in Imperial County. It's one of the worst in the state, and it's pretty high in the nation as well. Mm. We're not proud of this. We want to change this. Mm. Um, But it is an issue here. And so the backpack goes home with that child on the weekend and provides some food for them and possibly their family or a younger sibling who isn't of school age um, to at least get them back to school on Monday. So you, um, you guys do like a little research on, on the child, um, when you, you know, the child, the backpacks specific to, to a child. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, there's usually one meal for a family to prepare in there, but a lot of it is easy open things because we don't know what's going on in that household. We don't know if that child is with adults or not, or has to feed itself or fend for itself. Mm-hmm. They're, you know, themselves. So there's the combination of, of product they can eat alone or have somebody prepare for them. Okay. And um, this is, this isn't like something that it's not a program that, you know, it's um, kind of like demanded to you, uh, by you for like the government. It's something no. that you guys, yeah, as a it's facility. completely privately run, and we get a little bit of help from some foundations who um, help us. But um, as you can imagine, we're not a county that uh, gets a lot of foundation support. Yeah, not a lot of uh, clout in in you know giving money to Imperial Valley. Mm-hmm. The foundation money tends tends to stay in urban areas, and so it's harder to get foundations to look here to support us. So we really do uh, need to rely on our local citizens to help take care of kids in the valley. How um, you, you mentioned it's 180 for the whole year. Yes, um, 15 a month. But how um, do people uh, do? They come here and no. And, no. Um, what happens in the schools is the teachers are looking for those signs the first two weeks of school, and it's pretty easy to see that. Uh, um, 
teachers know that I think intuitively we, we try to educate um, schools what signs to look for, um, asking when is lunch, uh, falling asleep, uh, you know, not having enough stamina to get through the day until they get to uh, a meal. Um, those are just some, but then the school tells us how many backpacks they will need to provide for the kids that they have. And then we've developed sort of a hub and spoke system um, where we will take all the backpacks for say the North end and have them ready for um, one of the trucks from the Brawley school district comes down and picks all them up. And then they come down to Brawley and get the backpacks. And then we go out to Winter Haven when we run our truck to Winter Haven, we take those backpacks out and Don Glazer, you know, takes them to Calexico. And so we've developed um, systems over the years where um, the schools are coming to get them from some means, not necessarily here to the food bank because we're not centrally located. We're a very big county. Yeah. And so not everything can happen directly from our site. And but uh, the donation, like, say, I want to sponsor somebody. How? Oh, OK. Hmm. Um, there's actually a tab on the, um, PayPal, um, a donate button button on our website that says specifically to the backpack program, or you can just say this is uh, a backpack, uh, donation. Okay. Okay. And, and it will go to that program. And whenever we see $180, we know that's, That's you know, definitely for the backpack program. So, uh, we make sure that gets designated accordingly. Okay. Okay. Um, when, um, the last time I came, we were talking about the kitchen that you guys are going to have over there in the new facility. Mm-hmm. Um, and somebody, I think Tiffany mentioned that, you know, it could kind of like help as a, um, a way to bring kids to like learn how to cook a healthy, some healthy food at the same time, you know, stay, stay there and, you know, maybe have that meal for, for the day or, or whatnot. Um, do, do you know how that, how the, you know, or, and she mentioned something about maybe having uh, volunteer chefs, you know, come by and, mm-hmm. and, and show some classes. Do you want to? Well, um, we are, we know that we're not going to, in our lifetime, we're not raising money again to build another building. And so we build it with as many bells and whistles as we could pack into the place so that we had the potential for all kinds of programs. Now, do I have funding to run those programs right now? No. And uh, that's my next job after like everything gets done there is, is to work on um, funding that we can tailor specifically to many, many needs in the Valley. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of which is um, childhood ob- um, obesity prevention uh, and helping to manage diets of diabetics. I mean, just, you know, kitchen, kitchen help for, you know, uh, diabetes management. So there's a lot of potential for uh, what we can do in the kitchen, which is a safe place uh, where we can sort of, you know, taste food and oh it's not so bad without you know those horrible things in it um i i don't want to say uh i can tell you things we'd like to do but i can't tell you what we're going to do yeah yeah you know it's going to depend on um on money which unfortunately so much is tied back to you know what what um what programs we're able to fund in that facility but we absolutely want to get um we want to have some real impact in people's lives so that it isn't just a pamphlet, you know, improve your health, mm. but actually let's, let's actually make food and, and talk about how this is going to be better for you and your family. Mm. Yeah. Especially here that, you know, we have uh, ways of getting, you know, fresh produ- uh, produce. Like it, we have a farmer's market that you can stop by and grab uh, really cheap uh, produce and also talking, also talking to Jesse, and he wanted, he's kind of like trying to push so that um, EBT can be accepted at, at the farmers markets here because mm-hmm. we get, you know, if you go to a farmers market, you get produce like ch- cheaper than you would at a mm-hmm. at a supermarket. So yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things that you know that we can do to kind of like we can have more more farmers markets too. Yeah, exactly. And because I mean, the one in Imperial, it's probably the, the biggest one, and mm-hmm. I don't think they sell, they have any produce there. Mm-mm. So I mean, it, it's kind of ironic in it, a valley that produces this much produce. Yeah, um, yeah, and it's yeah. A, maybe like a call out to you know the local farmers to maybe um, help and donate to those farmers markets, and, or a call out to smaller farmers to grow for a, a farmers market industry. Right? Because so many of our farmers are big egg, and and it it gets moved out of the valley, and yeah, you know, they don't have the time to to deal with that, but. 
farming is a very good business. And if we could develop some small farmers that grew for the local market, that could be um, a game changer for some people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Is there anything else that you would like to add that we kind of missed or... Well, I would just say I'm I'm excited about the future. There's um, um, for us, you know, having this new building and the, the potential to do all kinds of stuff there, including classes. Um, we are creating an outdoor area where we can do some classroom uh, work, nutrition education, and physical activity um, in that space. But having um, a building large enough that we can actually grow our programs is exciting. Um, I'm excited about some of the the people we're starting to um, see here at the food bank who are interested in helping and in volunteering and and moving us forward. Um, that that's exciting too. We've, um, we we have great people here, but we need more energy that's moving toward positive things. Um, and I'm starting to see some of that come, and that's exciting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I've been telling somebody that you know, people, people in general that I've been talking to because of the podcast that, you know, the valley's kind of changing. Like it's, people feel more, more helpful, more friendly. Um, there, there's more of a sense of community. So, um, yeah, maybe that's the change that's you know, trickling in here to the mm-hmm. to the food bank. So, um, all right. Well, yeah, I think that that's pretty much all the questions I had and and I hope that you know I was able to inform the community and and you know spread the word in terms of you know how ways they can help the food bank the backpack program you know everything that and if they have any more questions you know they're I'm sure that you guys are more than welcome to to answer those questions for them Um, I'll make sure to share share the links for the website and Mm -hmm. and and um, you know you can follow you guys on, on Facebook um, and Instagram and I know Instagram, you, guys, yeah. you guys have been posting stuff on there thank you Stephanie <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stephanie is here in the background and, and she's the one that's uh, in charge of all that I, I see pictures of her you know running around with kids and, mm-hmm. and, and doing yeah. all these activities so. she's doing great work with our preschool program right now mm-hmm. um, but yeah um, thank you so much for taking this time and, and, and thank you, you know, I wish you guys nothing but the best um, and yeah um, thank you awesome All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you on the next one. Peace.